afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see such a good crowd here. And I know we've got a couple of people from different spots on the university. So thanks. Welcome to our guests. Um, I'm Roxy Thorin, department head in landscape architecture. And I want to welcome you to the first lecture in the department's annual Bracken lecture series. The lecture series is made possible by the generous gift of Dr. John R. Bracken, who is the head of the department from the 1920s to the 1950s. The series began in 1982, bringing speakers to enrich the experience of our students. The Bracken Committee solicits nom nominations for speakers from both students and faculty members. And the annual speakers bring to our campus some of the most innovating and emerging ideas in landscape architecture. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Julie Stevens, who I first met when she was a graduate student at the University of Oregon, I think in my second year of teaching. <laughs> so it was like a year or two ago. <laughs> um, her master's research and her design project, master's research slash design project, was looking at the idea of industrial landscapes before they become post-industrial and we have to fix them, um, asking what if we design these landscapes so that rather than being ruined by the industrial processes they hold, they can come out healthier and improved with the post-industrial site. And I think that idea or that ethic that intelligent design can mitigate harm or even catalyze regenerative processes has continued in her work as a designer and a scholar. She's an associate professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture at Iowa State University, where she's developed an innovative student design build service learning program. <coughs> in 2011, she established a multi-year partnership with the Iowa Department of Corrections to create therapeutic environments for prisons, including gardens for prison staff and for incarcerated individuals. The team of students, prison staff, and incarcerated individuals at the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women, ICIW, received the Award of Excellence in Student Community Service from ASLA in 2015 for the ICIW Outdoor Classroom, and the 2018 ASLA Award of Excellence in Stu Student Community Service for the Children's Garden, a visiting garden for incarcerated women and their visitors. Stevens is also developing a trauma-informed design program focused on bringing the healing powers of nature to vulnerable and underserved children and adults. The work received the 2023 ASLA Award of Excellence in Student Community Service. So look forward to seeing you taking that up in the next few weeks. <laughs> She's also a founder and co-chair of the ASLA's Environmental Justice Professional Practice Network, which focuses on creating healthy environments by integrating environmental justice issues into landscape architectural education, research, and professional practice. So we're looking forward to the lecture and welcome to you. Okay, is this thing working? Awesome. I have a teacher voice, so I don't really need this microphone, but they tell me it will sound better. So. Thank you all for having me here today. I'm excited to, to be at Penn State. Thank you, Roxy, for the invitation um, for the faculty who have had many awesome conversations with in the last 24 hours. It's been great. And students, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and amazed at the work I saw this afternoon. I know you're just getting started, but there's some really deep things there. Um, and I applaud your faculty for taking on such an important project. Um, so I was excited to learn about Bracken this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk today about trauma-informed design as a sort of emerging area of practice and scholarship. Um, and I have a few housekeeping things I want to work through first. So first of all, never thought I would use the chalk duster font in my career, but I did. So if you're thinking, wow, I didn't know anybody used the chalk duster font, now you know somebody who does. Um, I also want to acknowledge and, and share my gratitude for the indigenous people whose land we gather on today and the vibrant communities who still make their homes here. You're gonna see some images like this where faces are blurred um, and this is to protect the identity of the incarcerated individuals and the youth that I've worked with for many years now. I don't like this method. I would rather you see their faces and their expressions and the emotions that, that come about in the work that we do together. Um, and, but this is for their benefit. And I can tell you that most of them would rather not be blurred. Either. So hopefully you can at least get a little bit of the spirit of um, the folks we get to work with. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk today about a developing framework for trauma-informed design. Right? So I'm going to be a little vulnerable with you today. I'm going to tell you I don't know everything that I need to know about this. Nobody does. 
Um, I don't have all the answers, but I do have some things that I'd like to share with you that I think are worth replicating, I think are worth digging into deeper, um, and um, some things that I'm not going to talk about today. So part of the framework that my colleagues and I um, are developing is really um, about a number of things. Design, right? Here we are. We're environmental designers. Um, we're going to talk about human development and some psychology theories. Um, part of our framework is really drawing from the field of environmental psychology, so you know biophilic design and prospect refuge theory and those kinds of things, right? You should all be nodding your head. I'm looking at the students. Um, so I'm not going to cover those things today because I already have 485 slides to get through. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. So I already have too many slides and things I want to get through. So we're not going to talk about those environmental psychology theories, that they are not unimportant, right? They are part of this, this process. Um, so another thing I should note is we, we are going to talk about trauma today. I'm not going to share stories about people's traumas, um, but there, I just, this is your trigger warning. So self-care is encouraged. So if any of the terms or content is upsetting to you, please um, do what you need to take care of yourself. So the first thing I'll say is um, I am not an expert in trauma. I'm not a social worker or a counselor. Um, but fortunately, we have really good people in those fields who are. And so I've been collaborating with a few folks namely um, Dr. Barb Taves, who's at the University of Washington in Tacoma. She's in the criminal justice program. She is a restorative justice pioneer and has actually, she's from Pennsylvania originally and has done a lot of work here in the Pennsylvania correctional system. Um, also Amy Wagenfeld, who has degrees in everything, I think. So human development, psychology, um, and occupational therapy. And she's been a practicing occupational therapist. Um, and also Dr. Tricia Neppel, who is at Iowa State in uh, human development and family studies. And so together we have really started to craft this framework. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at trauma, right? So there's different ways that we can sort of categorize types of trauma. So this is not the end all, but this is, a, I think, a helpful start to our framework that we're gonna build out here to, together today. So we have individual trauma, complex trauma, secondary trauma, intergenerational, racial, and systemic. And I, the reason I like this particular strategy here is that it scales. It's also a scalar, like the way that we think about design. I also want to differentiate between trauma and toxic stress. Um, so I saw some students today presenting who looked like perhaps you were feeling a little stressed, right? maybe a little sweaty, maybe your heart rate is up a little bit. That's actually, believe it, you're not gonna, I know you don't wanna hear this, but that's actually up here in the positive stress category, right? That's actually stretching you in a way that's okay. Now, tolerable stress is um, things that, you know, maybe your car breaks down and you can't get to work for a week and it's super, super stressful, but you have support. You have somebody who's gonna lift you up, take you to work, help you through the process, right? So that's tolerable stress. And then we have toxic stress, which is also not to be confused with trauma, but very much related. Um, the big difference here is that toxic stress happens without that support. So it'd be you without a car, about to lose your job because you have no support, right? You don't have those um, relational buffers. So the CDC, there's a little delay here, I think. The CDC, um, has a, a, an approach that's been adopted for trauma-informed care, okay? So we're not, we're not practicing trauma-informed care, but if we can align ourselves with folks who are, we can really think about how design impacts people who are, um, have experienced trauma. So the, you don't have to read all of this, but essentially what it's saying is that these six things are important if you have experienced trauma. Um, and this is, part of the framework they use for um, training folks who are, are working directly with folks who have trauma. The thing that I think is also really important here is that they say this is not a one-time thing, right? You don't get to help somebody by providing or encouraging these six things and then say, all right, you're good now, right? This is a constant rechecking in, you know, growing and developing alongside of people who may need help um, coping with trauma or traumatic events. 
And I think that's also important in the design work that we do. Um, so if you're interested in this kind of work, that I would highly recommend The Body Keeps the Score. Um, Bessel van der Kolk wrote this book um, maybe a decade or so ago, and it's become, quickly become the, probably the most read book on trauma. Um, and I include this image from his book because I think it's important to, to note that part of the development of this framework is also understanding the body's response. And I think this is also critical for designers. How many of you have taken a human development class lately? Good for you. You should all try and fit one into your schedules if you can. Um, so part of this is understanding what the stress response does inside the body. Because the really cool thing, you guys, is what we do has every opportunity to counter or buffer or calm that stress response, right? So you know fight, flight, freeze, fawn, flag. There's like seven different Fs now, I think, in that category. Those stress responses that happen inside your body um, are, can very much be settled by time spent in nature. This is one of my favorite images I've ever taken. So this is uh, one of the kids from Youth and Shelter Services and one of our students, and we were out exploring a local park together, really trying to think about what kinds of spaces they might like um, in the design of their new environment, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. So another major component of this framework is looking at risk and protective factors. When I first started working with the Department of Corrections, um, I'll give you just, uh, as some of the faculty were asking me about this, I'll give you a little background. Um, I was in my first semester as an instructor at Iowa State, very green. I was just a couple of years out of grad school, so a couple of years ago, right, Roxy? Um, so I was just a couple of years out of grad school and um, started teaching, and I had a knock on the door, hey, any interest in a women's prison design project? And I said, yes, absolutely. I didn't know anything about corrections, right? I would like to tell you that I had some sort of research project that I had done and I had all this understanding. No, they just needed somebody who understood community design and plants and I fit the bill and I said yes and it was great. So I, I thought, okay, how do I get, I need cliff notes real fast because it was, you know, I had developed this class in two months. So I, I knocked on the door of our sociology department and they said, oh, this sounds really cool, but you, you'll never affect the recidivism rate. And I just felt blasted, you guys. So um, that did not stop me. It actually just kind of made me a little stronger, maybe. I marched back to my office, and I started looking up recidivism rates. Do you all understand recidivism rate? This is how they calculate when people go back to prison. So they go to prison, they come out, they go back in. This is a super flawed number. So if you look at recidivism rates, and our politicians love to look at recidivism rates, every state factors them differently. There's different ways of calculating them. So when I figured that out, I thought, geez, there's got to be another lens to look at this project. There's no way I can prove that, uh, that what we do inside this prison and gardens is going to affect the recidivism rate. The Department of Corrections had just started using risk and protective factor research. And so I, I dug into this research and, um, and what I learned is we, live, we are all living risk and protective factors every day. Um, some of us are living out more risk factors, and some of us more protective factors. So um, essentially, you know, risk factors are things that, that affect you in a negative way, and, and protective factors are things that buffer those or ha have positive impacts. This is, I don't expect you to read this, but just to give you an idea, this is directly from youth.gov, although my students formatted it for their presentation. This is from youth.gov, and this is probably one of my favorite sources on risk and protective factors because it goes through life stages through young adulthood. Um, in the work I'm doing right now, I'm working with kids 8 to 17 primarily. So those, you know, prenatal to young adulthood, and it, it goes through risk factors um, that are possible in those age ranges, protective fa factors that are possible in those age ranges. Do you, can we design for all of these? Probably not, but there are some that we can that are really, really important. Um, so let's, we're going to dive back into um, trauma again for a second. So is anybody familiar with the ACEs study? Okay, so ACEs is Adverse Childhood Experiences. It was a study that was done by Kaiser Health in the 80s, maybe, and it made a lot of people really angry because it was, um, it started out as a, 
a weight loss study. They did a massive survey to try and understand why people in this obesity clinic would shed all this weight and then put it all back on. And what they found out was that folks who kept coming back to the clinic um, had, had, had experienced a high number of traumatic events. So, you know, fast forward this to um, the last few years. This is Dr. Wendy Ellis. Um, she's at the Milken Institute, and she took this a step further. So if you look at these top, these top 10 things here, and I don't mean by top 10 or not top 10, but the, top, the things on the top, the 10 items on the top, were the original ACEs study. And she very intelligently said, and a number of folks did, that's not the whole story, right? Um, just because you're, there was substance abuse in your home or your parents were divorced doesn't all of a sudden mean that you have um, you know, trauma that you can't work through. And it, those things aren't without other influences, right? So then we start to add in things that are happening at our community scale, um, like poverty, racial discrimination, poor housing quality, uh, which we, we saw a little bit of that today in your Brecken project. So when we take kind of a look at all of this as a, a lens for looking at people's experiences with trauma, we can start to think about how designers and planners can really impact um, folks who have experienced trauma. So um, for example, if we look at um, redlining, right? You guys have just learned about redlining. Um, we know that redlining, you know, the impacts of redlining still exist today. Uh, that's that sort of community scale trauma that still exists, and we can address that. Sometimes it feels like it's at the planning scale, but a lot of those really lived experiences happen more at the design scale. Or you think about um, environmental injustices like lead in our water, right? There's a direct link between criminal activity and lead exposure. Um, so when we think about communities that have to fight for quality water, that's an environmental injustice. That's trauma, right? And then let's um, talk, we'll shift gears here and talk a bit about protective factors. So um, Dr. Taves and Dr. Wagenfeld and I developed this base set of protective factors. These are base protective factors because these are things we all need. You all need this, I need this, right? Um, but then we're going to take it a step further and think about what protective factors uh, we can really hone in on in designing for particular communities. And I have a couple of case studies that I'm going to share with you. In the studios that I've taught, we, we learn all of this stuff. And I know some of you have, you know, you've been talking about redlining and discrimination and those types of things. And it feels heavy, right? This is, it's kind of a lot. Um, and you thought you were going to get into this design field and just make happy gardens, right? Uh, but we have a social responsibility to address inequities. One of the ways our students have found um, to learn about and digest and articulate these ideas to other people um, is to make games, which at first when they proposed this idea, I was a little iffy because I, I was concerned that perhaps the games um, could be perceived as making light of the situation, and it's not. So this is um, from the Youth and Shelter Services Project two years ago, and they did sort of a family game night, and we presented it to the design firm that carried through the project. Um, so we took the game of operation. You guys remember that? It's a little tweezers and it does buzzes. We took that and we made it brain operation. So we talked about the different parts of the brain and how stress responds, um, how the brain responds to stress. They played a game of uh, don't break the ice. There was a potato head. And all along the way, they, people were being dealt cards. So they, they called this game, the cards you're dealt. And this was sort of a magic moment that I couldn't have planned. But one of the lead architects on the project got dealt all risk factors. So when he got to the end of the game, he came up to me and said, well, my life kind of sucks. And I said, tell me why. And he goes, look at this. I got all risk factors. I didn't get one protective factor. And I said, yep, and that's the card that some of these kids we're working with have been dealt. So take those cards back to your desk, pin them up, and keep that front of your mind as you design this campus for these kids. 
it's, those are the things that you just can't plan. So this next one I'm really excited to share. This is just this semester we're working on a project with a domestic violence shelter. And again, similarly, the students are trying to understand body and brain functions, how those are affected by stress, trying to understand risk and protective factors. So they created this um, life-size board game, essentially. And uh, it's pretty fascinating. So we got these big blow-up dice, which are pretty fun to play with. And you roll a dice, and you move forward. And if you land on a, a protective factor, you roll again, and you move forward. If you land on a risk factor, you roll again, and you go backwards. And there's, there's, a, there's a point, and we didn't do this intentionally either, where a lot of people were getting hung up kind of at the beginning. They kept getting risk factors and going back. I played this game. I got sent back to like beyond the beginning of the game four times in a row. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, I thought about cheating. <laughs> I really did. I was like, I, don't, I can't deal with this. I have, I have other things I need to think about and focus on. I can't roll another risk factor. And I thought, oh my gosh. That's exactly what the game was intended to do. We also had um, a faculty member who played the game and was having so much fun because it's a game, right? Rolling the dice and hopping through and, oh, this is being really competitive. Got to the end of it. And what we had at the end was all these beautiful boards about the psychology of what we're doing, right? So kind of describing more in detail why, why we made this game. We also had profiles of a number of people, real life stories um, from people who had experienced trauma. And this faculty member said, oh my gosh, you guys, I am so embarrassed. I really made light of this. And I realize now that this is actually some people's reality and I wish I would have taken it more seriously. And I think, you know, when, we talked about revising the game. If we do this again, do we want to set up that information at the beginning so people understand what they're getting into? Or do we allow people to play the game? I'll let you guys think about that. Do you allow people to play the game, sort of walk in it, in it, into it innocently and have that revelatory moment at the end? So those were pretty fun. We also, because I had a little grant, we were actually able to make real stickers, let me tell you. You can print anything these days. So um, I believe in a very deep and thorough and loving design process. So we design our participatory process. We use a lot of different techniques. I will tell you it is nimble. Um, it is not, I do not plan it, students plan it. Um, and, and it changes, right? So we set out on a course, but we know we have to maneuver and navigate around a lot of different things, especially when working with real people in real communities. Um, I pull a lot of techniques from this book, Designing Democracy. One of the techniques that I really love to use with students, we don't do this with the communities that we've worked with because they're already sort of, you know, vulner living the, a vulnerable life. But for students, I think it's really important, and you guys can try this too, but essentially you're positioning yourself on this spectrum of power and privilege. Um, and you're thinking about, you know, the lenses that you look at the world with. What are you designing um, and why? Is it for you? Is it because you think it would be cool? Or is it for the folks who are really living in the communities that we're working with? Um, we also do this sort of nested diagram with each of our projects. Um, for me, this is, and this is me, but I center the individual. This gets me in a lot of hot water when working in correctional settings, right? Correctional administrators, they don't want you to center the individual, the incarcerated person. Um, you know, they want to see everybody as equal, uh, but they're not, right? But if we can lift up the voices of people who are marginalized, everybody gets to come up with them. Um, same is true with the kids that we've worked with in shelter. We, we center them at the, at the heart of the work that we do. Sensory focused design. Have you guys gotten into any sensory focused design? Oh, wait a second. I meant to quiz you first. How many sensory systems do you all have? Did some of you see it? I hear six. What do you think? What did you learn in elementary school? My second grader just came home with something, and it was about her sensory system, and she read it, and she said, 
you have five senses. And she goes, Mom, they're not even, that's not even right. You have eight. <laughs> Seven-year-old. There's eight. You have eight sensory systems. Are you ready? There, your design career is about to take a turn. Okay, you know the top five, right? But did you know about these three? These three are so important in design, right? This is how we actually live in the world. So proprioception is your understanding that your, your body is in this space, right? For people who have experienced trauma, they detach themselves from their body. Their body's not their own. Not all people, some people. Um, so like if, if you stood up and jumped right now, you would feel that vibration through your body. That's your proprioceptive awareness. This is why kids jump off of things. It's 100% developmentally appropriate. Um, vestibular is balance, right? So can you balance on things? These are great tools to use in our design. Interoception, so that's, I'm, you were cold, right? So you put on a jacket. Roxy's interoceptive system is working just fine. So, but if you've experienced trauma, these systems, including the, the original five that you know, could be out of balance. Connections to nature. This is another key component. And like I said, I'm not going to go into all the environmental psychology theories, but we do use a lot of different theories. Prospect refuge being one of the most important, right? Jay Appleton. Um, and the reason for that is if you've experienced trauma, uh, if you've experienced abuse in your home or community, you're sort of always looking over your back. And to be in a space that allows you prospect and refuge um, is really important and therapeutic. Okay, I have two case studies that I'm going to share with you today. And I could talk about both of these for days. So I will watch my time a little bit here. Um, the first one I want to talk to you about is the work we've done at the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women. I have worked in a couple of other prisons in our state as well. Um, and the other one I'm going to talk to you about is with our Youth and Shelter Services organization. Um, this is a really quick background. So the women's prison uh, was... They started reconstruction in 2010. That was when they called me and said, can you help us address the landscape? We did a series of projects over about eight years. So the first was what we call the outdoor classroom. Uh, I was told people couldn't sit on the grass. It's ridiculous, right? Um, the, the correctional officers were feeling a little rubbed and left out. So we created this staff decompression space. Um, then the, the, the excuse me, the um, psychiatrist for the Department of Corrections came to me and said, I love gardening, and I think it would be really positive for the women in the acute and subacute mental health units to have a garden space that is their own, private, away from the rest of the, the prison. So that was that project. And then this was the project that I wanted to do from the beginning, the children's garden or visitor's garden, we sometimes call it. Uh, and I kept getting pushback on it because it was it's sort of the the place in the prison that interfaces with the public, and everybody was quite nervous about bringing different materials and expanding that. I don't expect you to read this, um, but the, the reason that I kept coming back to this project, so every year I would sit down with the Department of Corrections and the warden, and we would say, what's the next project we want? Okay, last year was good. What's the next project we want to do? And I would say, the children's garden, and they would always go, ah, oh, we're going to have to change the secure perimeter around, like, we don't, that's just, we can't do that. Finally, I got a yes. And the reason that it was so important to me was because if you read it all about the, the lives of children who have a parent who's incarcerated, the statistics are pretty sad, right? So if you have a parent who's incarcerated, you're more likely to go to prison yourself. Um, you feel abandoned. There's confusion. There's just a lot of um, lack of attachment to parents, depending on ages. So that was really always my, my driver. Um, so I'm going to go through the process with you real quick. So again, faces are blurred. I wish I didn't have to do that. Um, but I want to just, I'm going to flip through these really quickly, but I want to tell you, because the process is so important, you guys, and we don't take enough time in the beginning stages of design we want to jump in and, and create solutions almost immediately, right? But the process in the beginning for us in that 2010, 2011 was really pretty transactional. I'm not proud of that, but I didn't know how else to approach this. So we did surveys, we did focus groups. Um, but by the time we started getting into these projects, it's like a two second delay on flipping these. 
um, we started to involve the women who are incarcerated more. They became part of our crew. Um, to the point where we, we actually had them Um, help, we helped them to develop a committee, right? So we, we went from, we had the power, the warden always has the power, um, but we had the power to passing the power off to the people who were living there. And this took a lot of work, and we helped them write a bylaw structure. They were making their own decisions in the garden. Um, and then they had the structure of deciding, you know, what to do each day, what to handle, um, which was pretty amazing. And then by the time we got to the children's garden, we really turned the pencil over. There's so much power in your drawings. Don't ever forget that, right? You're making decisions. Your imagination is what somebody else is going to live, right? Those are the spaces other people are going to be in. Um, these two just totally rocked our world and the Department of Corrections. So we had this little courtyard space that was sort of set into the prison. You'll see it here. It's, well, it's here. So we had this little courtyard space that was approved. We got approval to take the fence out here and just go to here. And then these, these two folks here said, you know, we watch a lot of people with their kids at visits, and they don't have anything to do. Like, kids need to move their bodies. Can we, can we help them, like, get out and move? And then somebody else said, yeah, and they, they don't get the chance to teach their kids how to ride a bike. Do we have a bike path in here? So our garden went from this to, not kidding, this. Like, we had to get new paper. But we have a bike path in it, right? a tricycle path. So um, they also helped us with the participatory process. So we had a crew of incarcerated folks who were on our design team. They helped develop the process. They took the process out to the rest of the prison. So they took this collage project out into each of the units and helped us actually work through it um, with hundreds of folks. Um, they developed activities, along with our students, of course. They developed activities for kids to do. So we went in during visiting hours on the weekend and did activities with the kids. These really informed a lot of what we ended up with. So. Um, a very astute student asked me earlier today if I had any ideas about techniques that were better than others. And this is not a good technique. Okay, this is a beautiful drawing, right? Any idea why this is not a good technique for community design? Yo, is this a good drawing? This is a good rendering, right? I think it's beautiful. What do you think? What, what could be a potential problem if you take this into a community? Yes, absolutely. Were you on my lunch session today? It feels complete. When people look at this, especially folks who are not accustomed to looking at designs, they look at that and they go, okay, looks great. What else are they going to say, right? There, we leave no openings in a drawing like this for critique. Um, I'll show you some, some drawings that I prefer shortly here. So this is the construction of the garden. Um, we, this is a student design build. Um, I don't like doing concrete work, especially curves. And everything was curved. Um, so there you can see that, that fence. This was the big issue. But man, when that thing came down, you guys, the whole prison cheered. Maybe not some of the officers. <laughs> We had, um, we went back and forth a lot with security. So I had earlier, in earlier uh, projects, I had to rewrite po prison policy in order to get some of these gardens and spaces in here. Um, we also had to rewrite the policy on the fence, right? So we went back and forth about, does it have to have razor wire? How tall does it have to be? Could we put the razor wire on the backside so kids don't see it? And what we ended up with is after many years of working with the security director and, and sort of forming a relationship, maybe earning some, some trust, um, we ended up with a wooden fence that looks like a backyard, uh, very tall, but a backyard fence and no razor wire. It's got chalkboards in it. Um, and the tricycle path is, is used and loved. So it's got a playscape. 
It's got, we bought lots of toys. This was the best day I got to go to Target and buy all kinds of toys and balls, and it was fun. Um, these spinner chairs are one of the highlights for the kids. We did have somebody vomit on one of them once. Um, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the research, but I love this drawing. So we, Barb and Amy came and we did some interviews, um, some surveys. I'll share some of those results with you. But my favorite part of our research was having the kids draw their favorite thing. And there were a lot of spinner chairs, the tulip spinners. There was even one of the young woman who vomited. <laughs> So some of the results that we had from um, the study on the visitor garden, um, you can read through them, but there's, a, I think, a few things worth noting here. Um, people enjoyed the garden's beauty, right? So this is what we do. We're landscape architects, most of us. Um, <laughs> they liked having the opportunity for physical activity. Prior to the, the space being built, when people came to visit, they sat in very sturdy chairs in an interior space. Um, they liked engaging with nature, although I have found that m lots of people don't like bees, which is unfortunate. Um, and creativity. So there was lots of drawings on the chalkboard, people chalking on sidewalks. We have musical instruments, so there was a lot of music being played. Those things were really important. But this really blew me away. So we found in our research that there were four critical impacts that happened. One is that the visit became more child friendly. So over the years, I met a number of women who never had their children visit them in prison. They told them they went away to college or they had to move for a job, but they wouldn't tell them they were in prison and they wouldn't allow them to visit. And it's really critical that they maintain those bonds, right? It's actually better for kids statistically. It's better for kids to come to the prison and visit than to, to feel like they were abandoned or they don't have access to mom. Um, they had an improved effective experience. The th this third one I just think was amazing. It was home-like. This is a testament to the process, you guys. If we would have designed it with our design sensibilities, they wouldn't have felt like it was home-like. Those first two projects that we did, nobody's called that home-like. And I'm pretty sure nobody has ever called a prison home-like. Um, but they love this garden, and it's because they designed it to look like what's familiar. So you can think about that in the work that you're doing. It needs to look like something that you want to be in if you are the person who is there, right? It took a long time to get to that point. And improve parent-child relationships. I, I will tell you a quick story on this improved child, uh, parent-child relationships. There was a, a young woman who was incarcerated and her parents said, um, in the interview that seeing her out in the garden and, you know, sitting on a slide or on the tulip spinner made them feel like they could see her as the child that they raised and not the woman who was incarcerated in front of them. And it allowed them really to be a family while they were there. I thought it was really special. Okay, so now we're going to move to Youth and Shelter Services. Um, so Youth and Shelter Services is an organization in central Iowa that serves primarily the central part of the state, but, um, but really the entire state. Um, the programs that I'm working with, they have a lot of programs, a lot of in-home care um, and those types of things, but the programs that I, we are working with right now is the substance use treatment and um, their shelter care program. So what has happened is, um, well, okay, so what's happened is the, the director for the, the um, CEO of the organization really loves to be in nature and sees the value for kids. So right now the kids are in three homes in downtown Ames, which is a small community, about 60,000 people. It's a college town. It's a nice community to be in. There's mature trees in their neighborhood, but they can't really go out and play and use the outdoor spaces around them. So um, Andrew Allen, the CEO, is, had this vision for moving kids into a nature-based campus. This land was donated. It was 54 acres. It took a long time um, to find property that would work. It's kind of been wild and untouched. It's not pristine oak savanna like I wish it were. Someday we'll get it to some sort of um, state of equilibrium in the landscape. 
But um, this, and this is the student's design work. So the, the practitioner team that's developing this right now, it's actually under construction. They've kept most of the, the building site here, um, but we explored options for utilizing more of the site. This is um, just between Ames and Des Moines, so it's right in the middle of the middle of the middle, really. So in the middle of the state, um, which is in the middle of the country. So this is one of the houses now. So they're going to go from this to this, which is pretty beautiful. Um, there's a, a lot of love that this site needs. And I sort of like the metaphor in that. Um, and we've taken the kids to this site, but when we started this process, I, you know, I was drawing from a lot of what I learned in the prison setting, but being very conscientious and very clear not to conflate these two populations. Right, so there's kids in these programs who are justice involved, but this is not a prison. It's not locked. And these kids don't need to feel like they're on the trajectory to incarceration. So we're very, very careful to separate those things. Um, so this was our first engagement um, with some of the kids from uh, substance use treatment. And I look at this and I'm like, geez, it was a really warm day. They had so many sweatshirts on, right? So that's that interoceptive system, right? It wasn't quite working. They were seeking comfort, right? Wanting to hide a little bit. Um, but so our first engagement was literally just meeting at a neighborhood park. They were familiar with it, the place we all use a lot. And we just played some games and took a walk. Kind of just a, a first opportunity to get to know each other. All right, you ready? This one sailed like a lead balloon, you guys. So collaging, it's worked in other projects. We thought, all right, we're gonna go back to the park and collage. Students did a beautiful job pulling together materials, images, they had it all set up beautifully. They had it structured, right? So when we do these participatory processes, I have the students create a template. So they map out time, because it, time is really important, right? You have to map out time. They had this all planned out and nobody cared. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. They sort of put some pictures on. They were like, and then this cool thing happened. It was a beautiful fall day like it is here. This tree all of a sudden started raining leaves. And one by one, these kids from substance use treatment got up and just walked over to the tree. And they were just standing under it watching the leaves fall. And I thought, oh my god, what are we doing? We're trying to force them to be part of this design process. They just want to chill, right? And they, you know, they played games the last time we were all together. So we all stood under this tree, watched the leaves fall, and then they were like, can we go play basketball? So we played a couple games of pig. We talked, and we learned things about what they like and don't like, right? Um, and so that's, that's where I'm saying the process has to be nimble because you just never know what you're going to get. We later found out that they had had some unrest in the house, and it was, you know, it was just really hard for them to focus on anything. Um, and then we take them to the site, and we tromp around and show them, you know, the different spaces. Everybody always loves the creek. Um, and then I want to talk to you about, this is, was a really special moment. Well, how am I doing on time? Ten more minutes? Okay, so this is a, a pretty special moment where we took them to a local park, a highly, highly designed park. It's beautiful. And the thing they loved most were these impromptu structures that other park goers had built. And we kept finding these around. I had a little video I was going to play, but the audio wasn't, wasn't working super well. So, um, so they find this, and then we all gather up. So they're doing photo voice. Are you guys familiar with photo voice? So I gave them iPads. They're going around taking photographs of the things they love, and a lot of selfies. Um, so I ended up with, you know, 200 pictures, 150 were selfies, but that was okay. <laughs> uh, so they, they really love these structures. So we gather up and I said, tell me what you like. We like these things. Okay, why? Oh, I just think, you know, just, it's really cool to see what somebody built. And I would hang out in there. And, and one of the counselors said, well, what would you do in there? And these, these guys in substance use treatment said, I would take five. And I said, hold oh, on, I don't know what take five is. So take five is a, a coping tool that they teach the kids. And it's very, they, it's, they are very clear that it's not take five minutes and go beef up your argument and come back and argue better. It is take five and come back when you're ready to return to the group in a positive manner. 
And so they wanted this as a take five space. So that's how we ended up with our next participatory activity, which was to create our own take five spaces. So we went back to the site. The students gathered up all kinds of yarn, fabric, went to you know, Goodwill, Salvation Army, found all kinds of materials. And the kids each had a team of students to help them. And they chose, they wandered around and chose, they chose a site that they liked and they built their own take five spaces. Uh, this was one that I really loved. It had all these cool doors and windows. And we did this in the matter of 45 minutes or an hour. And they were temporary, meant to be temporary, but to really uh, start to think about how to engage the site. We brought like, student, the kids back to studio. So we, we did sort of YSS Wednesdays. So for two full semesters, we were with these kids pretty much every week um, for an afternoon or more, depending on the week. And this, so this was design your own bedroom. And what was really interesting is I've spent a lot of time in the houses with the kids and doing some research with them. And in the houses, they refer to their rooms by the number. And when they designed these rooms, I have videos of them describing them. They call them my room, uh, my space. And that's a critical difference, right? This is this sense of ownership that is important. They drew with us. They critiqued with us. Um, we had a lot of fun in studio, and of course, okay, so now we're going to go out a ring, um, and of course, we engaged the staff a lot, and that, I'm not going to talk a ton about that today, but I uh, spent a lot of time in listening sessions and working with staff to kind of understand priorities. Um, the kids have shared their ideas with the staff via our process, which has been really good, so we've facilitated that process between the YSO staff and the youth as well. So then we took all this information, you know, things we've gathered from our participatory sessions, the research that we've done, and in, in a big sort of working session, the students and I created a set of um, specific protective factors that were important for this group of kids. So we came up with, um, these are not in any order, although I would put relationships at the top, right? So safe, stable, nurturing relationships is the lingo, lingo that's used in human development. Uh, and it's the, probably the most critical protective factor for any of us, right? We need those buffering relationships. So executive function, a sense of ownership, right? That's where calling a, a room mine is important. Having access to nature, um, working on emotion regulation, and uh, relationships. I'm going to show how some of these played out in the design, and then I will happily take questions. Um, so I'll just, I'm going to flip through some of these, and you can just kind of get a sense for some of the spaces that were designed. And again, the design technique here is a hybrid, right? So it's part of it's digital, but it still has that hand-drawn effect. And the images of people in here are actually the kids at YSS and some of the staff. And they really love seeing themselves. They could pick themselves out. So we traced over them, um, you know, with the iPad. I love this gym space. It opens up the ropes course. Um, these were interdisciplinary option studios. So we had architects and, um, and interior design students and some graphic designers. So we were able to address interior and exterior. What we learned from their designing their bedroom was a, applied in the, the design of the bedroom. So you, it's a little hard to tell, but these are modular so they can change things around. Also giving them a sense of control and ownership. There's also a nook behind here. One of, the, um, one of the things that happens a lot with youth is when they're feeling dysregulated, um, they seek compression. And sometimes the counselors will find them rolled up in their mattresses because they're seeking that sort of pressure, right? So maybe some of you use weighted blankets. It's similar to that effect. So we gave them that sort of compression space where they could hide um, but still be safe. So here's a rendering that I don't appreciate, but I love the space. So this is a therapy yurt. So this is for um, groups. So everything's done in circle, like a restorative justice circle or AA circle. Um, and so counselors and group meetings are done that way. Family meetings are done that way. Um, but what we've done here is we've created views of nature all the way around and doors that push out, right? So if you're feeling dysregulated, you should be invited to go outside. And, and use the natural environment um, to restore your, your sensibilities. So this is how the Take 5 space evolved. Um, this will probably be our first design build, not this year, but next year. 
Um, <clears throat> what we've imagined is that the, we would have spaces that would be designated for the kids to create their own take five. So there would be something structural like a, a little deck space um, or a pad of some sort. And then the kids are invited to use materials, colors, um, and make their space their own. Because I feel so strongly, and the research supports this, that relationships are one of the most important factors here, um, one of the most important elements for kids, particularly in substance use treatment, is that they don't go home to the same situation that they left home in, right? So that when they go home, parents have new tools for supporting um, their substance use journey, and that they have worked through some of the the difficulties that they may have experienced prior to them coming to YSS. So we've created this family cabin where parents can come and stay for a night or a weekend. Um, these are things that are already sort of encouraged. Um, kids get to go home for a weekend as they get further into the program and meet certain benchmarks. But this allows parents to come here and be within a close proximity to counselors should they need that support. There would be food provided and things like that so they can really focus on their family. The kids love that. Um, and an alumni space. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is I've never done a design review this way, you guys, but it was so much fun. So we went out to the 54-acre campus. We invited all kinds of people local politicians, other faculty, students, the kids from YSS came out, um, staff and administrators, and the students had a blast. We dug through this old barn that was still out there. We found all kinds of things, um, and we staged their review across the entire 54 acres, right? So where the rec center was, we had a frame with their drawings, and it was propped up on an old chair. I have a chair thing, so the chairs are all mine. I'm maybe embarrassed to tell you. Drew a little um, inspiration from Humphrey Repton. Yes, there should be heads nodding. You all know Humphrey Repton. We happened to find these old windows and this old coat rack in the barn. So we hung it up and we invited the kids to come out. Uh, they drew giraffes and butterflies and all kinds of things. They wanted this to be a zoo or a farm. I agree with the farm piece. Um, and I think, you know, from, I'll just, I'm going to close with a little story about the, this particular youth who's drawing on this board. Um, this was somebody we worked with for probably seven or eight months. And at the end of it, he invited us to his graduation ceremony, which was probably one of the highest honors I've ever had in my career, to be invited to that ceremony. And then to see how the community sat in a circle and talked to him about their hopes and very real concerns. And to know that he was going to go out and have a lot of work to do, um, but that he was leaving with a lot of tools. And he told me he wants to come back and do um, therapeutic playscapes. And I said, come on back. We're going to do it together. So I hope someday I'll see him come back as an alum who uh, is ready to, to serve, give, give back. And I think he will. So lots of highlights in this career. OK, and my last note is if you have love to give, you should give it, because there's lots of people who need it. And I thank you. Happy to take questions. question about what so are these products you've done with your students like at Iowa State what is that collaboration when mostly like the build phase for like with the, the women's penitentiary mm -hmm. uh, what did the build look at look like with students what did the construction look like with students inside the prison a lot of waiting <laughs> um, you know, it's, I feel like I could build anything anywhere now, having worked through Sally Ports and security, and um, that's not true. I couldn't build everything anywhere, anything anywhere. But 
it's, you know, it, there was advantages and disadvantages. We had one thing that was an advantage is we we're both state institutions and we very much saw our resources that way. Like we're gonna share resources. That also came down from the administration who is very, very, very supportive of this project. Um, you've got some folks here who are wanting to do some things in the correctional environment here and are, are getting a little more pushback. I fortunately had a lot of support. Um, so we shared equipment they gave me a very old skid loader. I learned how to repair a skid loader because I had to if we wanted to move rocks. Um, and there were things that I, you know, that I had to supply, but there were things that they supplied as well. The hard thing is, you know, we had folks who were incarcerated working with us, men and women, and their pay is like 29 to 45 cents an hour. And I remember the day students were doing the calculation on the way home from the prison and they were like, wow, it takes them an entire week to make basically what we make in an hour. So those were, you know, there's no fair wages in the prison system. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Lots of security. Of getting stuck in Sally ports. Um, I have an observation and a question. So uh, it's been maybe several, 10 years or so. We have a huge state correctional facility. I flew over it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so I was visiting at one point and I met the guard uh, gate or whatever. And I look over and I see this very traditional playground equipment, little complex of stuff. Okay. But of course, it was behind I, I, countless layers of chain-link fence and razor wire. And it was just on this little sterile square, you know, encased with all this uh, security, you know, stuff. And it was just like, I, you know, we're, we're, I realized just how much I live in a bubble. And there I was in that environment for minutes. And I saw that. It was just really uh, heart-wrenching. So to see the... Was that for visits? Excuse me? That way they were using it for visits? I pre presumably. I didn't ask. I'm guessing kids come to visit their parent, and yeah. that's the environment that those children are interacting with their parents. And so to see you create that children's space is just really uh, phenomenal. So then my question is how has this work, has it changed you as a designer? And like, how, how did it, so how, how has that changed your approach or your, your design approach, I guess? Yeah, you know, I was actually thinking, Roxy, about Penny Helfand, who is um, my other major professor um, in Oregon, and how I just was amazed at how he could appreciate everything from literally a concrete donkey in somebody's front yard and fake flowers in somebody's landscape to, like, the most famous, beautiful la landscapes that we all hold up, right? And I think what's changed for me is I think we applaud a lot of those high dollar influential landscape projects or design projects. We hold those up like they're the gold standard, but they're not necessarily what everybody wants or needs. And we tried, and if you see in that, for the first project that we did, it was an acre, it was massive. Right, we were designing for 500 people, so we were designing it with, like it was a city plaza. Not maybe not exactly right, um, but it was sort of in the high design fashion of the you know the way the design world works. Students had a lot of fun with the geometries; it was cool, but it's not loved, and it's not used the way that I thought it was going to be. But this children's garden that really was designed by folks who were living there is loved and it's cared for and it's used. Um, some of the women have said it allows them to shed their identity as a prisoner and they can be mom or grandma or aunt. And I think that that's so much more powerful than trying to put Lurie Garden, and I love Lurie Garden, but trying to put Lurie Garden in a women's prison it didn't matter to them. So I want to follow up on Derek's question and ask a slightly different one. How has this experience changed your students? 
Oh, oh, I wish the warden were here to talk about it. She'll be at ASLA, so if anybody's going to ASLA, she and I are giving a presentation with Daniel Winterbottom on prisons on Saturday. Um, that's one of her favorite parts of this whole story because, you know, I had a student who came to me and said, I think I want to work on your design build crew, but I know you want me to tell you that I have these altruistic ideas about this, that I'm going to like, I want to be good in the world. I think I just want to build stuff. And, and I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. And he got into that prison and within a couple weeks, he came to me very emotionally and said, these women did not live the life that my mom and my sisters lived. And he, and he recognized it pretty quickly that um, he was living in a bit of a bubble, right? We all, I'm living in a bubble, right? And, um, and I think I heard that a lot, right? The other thing the warden always told the students is, especially the guys, that most of the women in the prison have had only negative relationships with men. And they had an opportunity to have positive relationships and not take advantage of that. So that was really important. And Julie, can I bounce off of Derek and Eliza? <laughs> <laughs> because I was thinking all the while, I, I mean, you are not a counselor. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and what well, first it was a, just a very uh, thank you for sharing it. It was, it was just uh, but you, didn't you as a as an outsider coming in there, but what was your growth, your learning curve, that growth thing? What, what did it take you to feel ever if ever you did? Not saying this is rude. You say whatever you want to say. To just with folks who are so damaged. Yeah. Damaged others. Mm -hmm. It's just a world so different. The problem is so different. Yeah. I don't know if I'm competent yet. <laughs> Sound like a dude. I, I think um, there's a couple things, right? So everything I've ever done in my life that was worth doing was purely out of love and with really, really great people. So Barb Taves taught me about restorative justice, and restorative justice at its heart is seeing people as human beings, right? So it, like, the default for me is when, when we're working in the garden, a lot of stories come out, and a lot of them are things that none of us want to think about. And whether they're telling me directly or I happen to be hearing stories, um, I never tried to counsel, but I always shared support. And I was very much criticized for that by the correctional staff. That was not okay. Um, but I don't know how to not be empathetic, sympathetic, loving, caring. I don't know. So that I guess that was the approach I took, and I figured if they had a problem with it, I bring it up to them and she and I would have a conversation about it. But I, I, you know, the, there was one major turning point for me in terms of feeling like. I kind of knew how to relate, and that was when I came in pregnant. Because prior to that, I had spent several years working in the prison, and I was just a professor, or that lady who builds things, depending on who you were. Some of them wanted to meet me because they'd never met anybody who was a college teacher. Um, and they would just come and say, I've never, I've never set foot on a college campus, and I've never met anybody who teaches college, and I just wanted to meet you. And then I came in pregnant. And all of a sudden, I was an expecting mom who needed a lot of advice. <laughs> I got a lot of advice. And I went to, and here, this is a brag moment, just full disclosure. I went to 40 weeks pregnant with both of my kids in the prison. And they were, with my first one, they were just sure that I was going to deliver that baby right there in the prison. So they were all prepared. <laughs> um, both of my kids were almost two weeks late, so it was fine. <laughs> but that was a huge shift, right? Then they saw me as a human and not just somebody who was coming in to do this sort of service project, right? Especially for people who've been in there for a long time, there are a lot of token efforts, right? Lots of people come in, they're going to save everybody, they're going to bring in their ideals and values, and people are all of a sudden going to have a better life. And I, I feel like you know, one of the great parts about what we do is we just bring nurturing environments that you can adapt to you, right? And, and engage it in the way that's good for you. 
Hey, Mark. Thank you. Uh, across all of your work, have you bumped up against people with pretty rigid design thinking in, in settings like this where design is about security or even more punishment? And how have you ne negotiated that bumping up against? Them? Have I bumped up against rigid security and what was the rest of it? Punish. Yeah, punish yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Design. Priorities for punishment. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's still actually the way most prisons are designed, right? So I was working inside two brand new prisons in the state. Um, and, you know, in all due respect to the design team and the administrators who were deriving the decisions and the priorities, a lot of it was, you know, nicer, newer, cleaner spaces, some of which were drastically different than before and many that were not. Um, and it's really, it's, I mean, it's hard to push the boundaries. I felt like we were able to do a lot more than I would have ever imagined. Um, but there were definitely things I would have liked to have seen differently. I'll give you an example. So intake is one of the scariest parts of the whole process. You've probably been into intake facilities here. So intake is one of the hardest things. You know, people are coming out of sometimes county jails. Maybe they've been there a while. They could be coming straight off the street in a police car, dropped off in a sally port. They may be detoxing, um, and they are put into a space that looks like what you would imagine, okay? So metal doors, like lots of clanking noises, stainless steel toilets, hard beds. Um, it is what you would imagine. The rest of the women's prison doesn't look like that. It's a much softer, much more home, no, it's not home-like. It's just softer, right? Um, more dormitory style, but that, to me, really set those people up at a disadvantage from the start because it's just upping all of those stress responses and then they have to answer a whole bunch of really personal questions, right? So they go from being interrogated in one setting to being interrogated in another setting. It's really not good for anybody. And it, affects, it affects how they get placed inside of the facility. That would be just one of many ways that would have liked to see things. Yeah. Take a while to build trust or Yeah. Yeah, we were talking earlier that when Barb and Amy come into the prison with me, they're like, geez, like eighty five percent of your job is PR. And I'll have correctional officers who come up and tell me about their kids' soccer game or this giant tomato that they grew. That took years. Um but it's important, right, that they, I, they want to be seen as human beings, too, and they want their concerns, you know, their concerns for safety are valid. Um, but, but then they also file grievances against my tomato cages and things like that. So, <laughs> there's a limit. Yep. Um, from being there from the start to the end, what's, like, the biggest difference in the daily life of the prisoners and their view and impact from how it was before to now having like an actual green space <laughs> Well, so, you know, we've done some studies on impacts. We did study the first project that we built, which I, you know, I've shared is it didn't, it didn't, it's not used the way that I thought it was gonna be, but the impacts that came back were positive. Um, you know, 75% of the women said it makes them feel calm. Makes them feel like they can make changes. I think the, you know, one of the biggest things that that I appreciated about the work that we were able to do is with the garden committee, right? That they have their own sort of governance and their own structure within the, the prison. So that meant they didn't have to wait for me anymore to get there to be able to do stuff in the garden or the management side of things. Um, that they, they could go to um, the sergeant and say, we need tools. So the sergeant would check out tools or we need hoses. These are highly secure items, right? A hose is a super dangerous um, tool in a prison. So those were all things that we had to work through. There's also, you know, the, the warden, because she supported this project so much, um, made a new position for one of the garden, one of the sergeants to become the yard and garden sergeant. 
which is pretty great, right? And a sergeant is above the correctional officers. So there's six sergeants, uh, yeah, approximately six sergeants, a whole bunch of correctional officers, but they have higher security privileges, um, more expectations, so it was good. Time for one more question, if there is one. Our question asker, she came to lunch with a whole list. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in regards to the um, youth and shelter services project, mm -hmm. um, how did you decide on the activities that you do with them to like learn more about them? Was how did I, we decide on the activities with the kids? So, um, because I believe the participatory process should be lived as well, right? That it's sort of a democratic process. Uh, the students actually develop a bunch of activities. So I have, a, like I said, I have a template. So they build out this, these activities. This is, here's the point of this. This is what we want to do. Um, here's time frames, that kind of stuff. And then I collect them. Um, this is how we did YSS. I've done it different ways, but this is how we did YSS. I collected all of them. And in front of them, I said, okay, I see this and this and this and this. I'm going to sort of put this in this order. We're going to do this. We're going to adapt this. I want to make a change here. And then we schedule it. We send that schedule to YSS and we say, you know, on these Wednesdays, Wednesdays we want to do X, Y, and Z. Are you willing to take them to a park that's about 40 miles away? Great. We want to do this. Want to have iPad, things like that. So um, that's kind of how that process goes. I used to just kind of develop that earlier on the prison project. I kind of developed those myself, but it's not as meaningful for me to deliver it as it is for you. To yeah, I think there was one other question. Yeah. Or other good question answers. I just, one thing I noticed, especially about substance abuse, is I feel like it's really inspiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's in like a community design studio for like the first time, would you say that that idea of like giving back control to people is like a big part of that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, again, if I, you know, I could, we, I could have talked this whole hour just on process, um, and I think. You know, it's hard because you're design students, right? So you want to go out and design and you want to make beautiful things and, and play with materials and create spaces. And all of that's really good. You should do those things, right? Um, but particularly if you are working with communities who haven't had a lot of control or power um, or haven't made a lot of decisions for themselves, have had things done to them, it's really, really important that you don't, you're not another group that goes in to do something for or to, that you are doing something with. Right. That is a good question. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is really wonderful.